Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Inside Scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. A election specialist extraordinaire. And as I turn on my mic, I um, want to welcome you, Ben, to the show. Thanks, Cesar. Thank you for coming. All right. We had an election. It was an exciting one. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's talk. Let's talk about the election. Overall impressions? Uh, any big surprises in Virginia for you? Um, no big surprises. I mean, this was sort of a status quo election. All 40 seats in the state Senate yep. stayed with the same party they had before. Yeah. Um, obviously, millions and millions of dollars were spent to change an outcome of any one seat. Not one. Not one changed. <laughs> um, in the House of Delegates, not one incumbent lost. It was the mm -hmm. first election in Virginia in the modern era where there was no incumbent that lost re-election, that sought re-election anywhere in the state for either the House or the Senate. Well, I was hoping that was going to be in the 86, Tom Russ. We'll talk yeah. about uh, Jennifer Boyska's win later, but uh, agreed. It, it was kind of a lackluster, no real surprises across the state. Well, and I think that it was driven by the fact this was sort of a Republican year up until the very end mm -hmm. when there was a real spike for the Democrats in the last week. Mm -hmm. And I think that sort of canceled out and, and it sort of left itself very neutralized. There were a lot of voters that went straight ticket this year on both sides. And it was very hard to move districts off their historic performance. Really? So no, not a big, huge down ballot drop off like we traditionally see? No. And I think that, you know, you look at like the Du Boisco race as a good example in Herndon. Mm -hmm. That's always been a Democratic seat, one that Tom Rust has yeah. won yeah. because of who he is. Right. And once he left it open, it reverted back this year to Democratic performance. And I think, you know, there's a lot of concern about it late. The Republicans were pumping a lot of money in there thinking they could hold the seat. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it wasn't even that close. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there was a, a third party candidate in there, right? Uh, uh -huh. So that kind of skewed it a little bit. A little bit, but Jennifer won by 11 points, which yeah. is, you know, a substantial win. Yeah, yeah definitely. So let's uh, let's get to let's break it down, kind of Senate and House. Let's talk yeah. about the Senate. Um, nothing transpired there that surprised anyone, right? The Dems were hoping to pick up or hold a seat, um, but um, we're still uh, Democrats uh, in the minority there, right? 21 Republicans, 19 Democrats. A um, lot of money spent on two races in the state. Mm -hmm. Which were the big um, ones? The McPike versus Parrish race, which was to hold a Democratic seat in Prince mm -hmm. William County, and then a Republican seat that was open in the Richmond suburbs, which was held by John Watkins. Now, that was the one Dems were hoping to pick off. Right? That was the one they hoped to pick up, yeah. right. Yeah. And um, they, they very lackluster turnout in the city of Richmond sort of was the difference there. Yeah, why, um, why do you think that was? Um, I think that the Dem I think that the, the the issues in Richmond City are, are harder to to grasp in the rural issues. And what happened is there was big turnout in Powhatan County, which is the rural county in the district. Right. There were a lot of local elections going on in Powhatan. And what you see, and the same thing happened in Fairfax, the General Assembly races get all the money. The local races actually oftentimes drive the turnout mm -hmm. and the interest. Um, and and you, you see that where th these local races in Powhatan drove turnout. And while they were there, they voted for the Republican candidates. Interesting, interesting. Don't you really have a, an effect of like the top of the ticket? I know this year we didn't have the governor or lieutenant, none of those big uh, statewide races, but at least countywide, uh, does that really factor into sort of that down ballot effect or, or not? In your I don't opinion? think it, I don't think the top of the ticket really mattered as much this year. Mm -hmm. um, I think that what really mattered was where there were individual races that really caught the public interest for different reasons. Mm -hmm. You saw turnout spike in other places. There was just no turnout whatsoever. Um, really, the downfall of Bettina Lawton's campaign, for example, for clerk. Fairfax County. Right, in Fairfax County, is like there was no turnout in the eastern part of the county because there were very few contested races. Interesting. See, and that's where I think, again, this is just my view on it, that a top of the ticket mm -hmm. debate or, or you know, contested race would have probably brought a lot more people out. Right, and Sharon Bulova was contested, mm -hmm. but barely contested. It, it, wasn't um, really, it wasn't really a... Fair right. fight, right? Right. Yeah. But, you know, if you look at the uh, opposition vote to her, she only carried two of the districts, Springfield and Sullivan, about 600 votes each, even with very little fight against her. So, so uh, Sharon Bulba. Right. Chairman Bulba. Exactly. Right. And so all the Republican candidates in those seats tended to do very well, with a couple of exceptions, mm -hmm. um, down ballot. Um, that's where I think Bettina, combined with those two districts, was down 10,000 votes. Mm -hmm. um, there was a third party candidate in that race, correct? Right. Okay. Who so. made a minor impact, but I don't think was the... I don't, they, you know, when, when it's that close, they're usually the difference, but I don't think that was the reason why the outcome was mm -hmm. what it was. What, um, so uh, sticking with Fairfax County, mm -hmm. uh, what else did you see? Any anomalies or anything interesting in Fairfax County? Well, I looked at, um, so 
it's the reason I bring up Bettina and Arthur Purvis is I look at both of them as having the the countywide campaigns where there's not enough resources mm -hmm. to really fully run your own campaign. Right. And so they're both running against incumbents. And so what that tells you is the votes that they get are basically the sample ballot votes by district. So if you take the Arthur votes and the Bettina votes by magisterial district, it tells you how many people approximately took the Democratic sample ballot, how many people approximately took the Republican sample ballot. Right. And in seven of nine districts, there were more Democratic sample ballots than Republican sample ballots. Interesting. And that's yeah. what drove, that's why the school board candidates were able to hang on. Right. Fairfax County is getting much more blue. Now in Springfield and Sully, there were actually more votes for Purvis than Bettina, which tells you there were more Republican sample ballots going out than Democratic sample ballots in those two districts. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, what I would add on to that is, you take a look at the individual supervisor races here in Fairfax, and there were five that were contested at the district level. Mm -hmm. um, if you take the sample ballot numbers out of those races, it gives you an idea of what's happening with the independents in those races. Mm -hmm. um, because you take out the Purvis number from the Republican vote and okay. the Bettina number from the Democratic vote. Mm -hmm. And what you see is, in a case, we'll go through the five districts. In Braddock, for example, General Lozak did not have the money to communicate with voters. So John Cook actually got 86% of the vote of those middle voters. Um, the Democratic... The, the, quote, independents. Right, because okay. she wasn't communicating with them. Now, he really should have been over 100% even penetrating the Democratic vote because she didn't have the money to communicate. Mm -hmm. So it actually was, in a lot of ways, an underperformance for him. Part of that may be driven by the fact she ran four years ago and some of its residual support. But it's not impressive when you're an incumbent and your challenger doesn't do a single piece of mail if you're not running the board of that middle ground. Interesting. Okay. Um, in Drainsville, mm -hmm. John Faust won 52% of that middle ground. So they almost split right down the middle. But his margin of victory comes from the fact there was a Democratic sample ballot edge of about 1,500 votes in Drainsville. Um, in Mason District, Penny Gro and Real quick, yeah. so Drainsville, because that's my yeah. home, was that more Great Falls, McLean, so Herndon? There was a Republican sample ballot advantage in Great Falls, which is why Kathleen almost lost. Yeah. Um, but yeah. there was a Democratic sample ballot advantage big in Herndon and big in the south part of McLean. Gotcha. Um, now, and it's interesting when you look at it precinct by precinct because of that. Um, and by the way, we, folks, overlapping are the Senate and the House races and on all these other... And how they impacted, right. right. Okay, interesting. Wow. Um, now, in Mason District, um, the independent challenger to Penny Gross actually won two to one among that middle ground voters. However, mm -hmm. in Mason, there's an, a 3,500 vote Democratic sample ballot advantage. So Penny easily went by. Here's how big the Democratic sample ballot edge is now in eastern Fairfax. Molly Loeffner would have had to carry 99% mm -hmm. of the independent voters to defeat Penny Gross. Right. And given that the county is slowly getting more and more Democratic, what that tells me is we are probably, this is the last election cycle where the Democratic sample ballot won't automatically mean 50% of the vote in Mason District. Right. It's already over 50% of the vote in Providence District. It's approaching 50% of the vote in Mount Vernon. It's almost at 50% in Lee District. So the sample ballot now is almost controlling, along with Hunter Mill, five districts in Fairfax County right where you just put your name on the ballot, you're gonna be elected, um, even if the Republicans run the table in the middle. Now, in Mount Vernon, Dan Stork got about 51% of that middle vote. So again, like Faust, split it right evenly down the middle. Um, and because of the Democratic sample ballot vote advantage, he ended up winning by about 2,000 votes. And in Sully District, we talked earlier, the Republicans actually had an 800 vote sample ballot advantage. Mm -hmm. And Kathy Smith won this, the independent vote by about 2,000 votes, 70%, wow. which is what flipped Sully from going Republican to Democratic. Nice, nice. So you look at those races and it tells you a lot of how are they playing out and why are they playing out. And it tells you the Republicans are basically, they're dead in five districts in Fairfax County. So now we're at the supervisor level. Mm -hmm. um, forget the chairman of the board race for a minute. Mm -hmm. What effect did the House delegate state races have on some of that turnout, if any, in your opinion? Um, I think they had some effect, but you know, you look at Sully, for example, and um, Tim Hugo got won with 65% of the vote wow. on the same day that Kathy Smith was winning. And really? a lot of those precincts, there was huge crossover for both of them. So Interesting. A lot of so this she ran is, a hell of a campaign. Well, it's different by the district. Some people mm -hmm. are winning more crossover votes. Others are winning Democratic sample ballot votes. If you look at Drainsville, Kathleen Murphy and Jennifer Boisco both running ahead of John Faust. So he was really damaged by that congressional race last year. It just wasn't enough damage to overcome the Democratic advantage there is now oh. in Drainsville. However, you know, Kathleen almost taken down by the fact there was such a Republican edge in Great Falls. That's why that race was so close. Sure, sure. Interesting. Um, okay, we, we talked a little bit about, let's go down another level. All right. Because the important thing in Fairfax, school. Okay. Board. Right? So um, 
there was a little bit of a surprise on the school board uh, election results, right? I mean, mm -hmm. what caused one of the state or the countywide uh, board members to lose that seat? Um, I, I think that there's a complicated factor, and it's, those are the hardest ones to analyze because it's voting for three. But but my gut is and it's is, countywide, right? I mean, they, they got to be, yeah. and they don't have the budget, right? I mean, look, the, the Democratic advantage in the county this year was probably around thirty-five thousand votes. Mm -hmm. Ryan and Ilyung, both of whom finished one, two in the school board election, only beat Jeanette, who was the Republican who finished third, by about four thousand votes. Really? So wow. they gave up almost ninety percent of their sample ballot advantage. Um, in the election. So the Democrats were getting buried by independents in the school board races this year. Interesting. They're just lucky that they survived and that she was the only one strong What do you think caused enough. that? Because that, that seemed to, that's a surprise. I, I don't, you know, it's hard to analyze. It's not the transgendered issue because mm -hmm. it would have taken down other Democrats with it if people were that socially conservative. I, I think that the school board just has a lot of issues with, especially with younger parents, um, and they're not doing a great job connecting with them. Interesting, wow. That's potentially. Now, when we're talking schools, though, the big school story was Prince William County, where the board actually flipped to Democratic control for the first time in recent memory. Five to three Democratic now on the school board. Three seats flipped from Republican to Democratic. Well, when, let's, let's save that discussion right. um, for the second segment, because I do okay. want to get into that. Sticking with Fairfax, right. um, any other like observations relative to any seat? I mean, just... just what does this mean going into next year? Let's let's kind of like it means absolutely board. nothing for okay. next year. Mm -hmm. um, all these races were all driven by off-year turnout, which is tiny. Mm -hmm. um, the meaning, you know, Obama won all nine districts in 2012 in Fairfax, in Fairfax, Fairfax County. County. Yeah. He won all nine districts in 2008. Even Sully, even Sully, even Springfield. Mm -hmm. I, I um, didn't know that. In Sully, they, he actually won easily. Um, he won by 6,000 votes in 2012. Oh it's the off-year turnout in Sully that makes it so Republican and off-off years. Um, but Democrats have to vote, people. <laughs> right, and the Democrats don't vote. Um, in Springfield, President Obama carried Springfield. Okay, so And when you look at this election, the big takeaway is Pat Harrity and Elizabeth Schultz, both of whom ran unopposed in Springfield this year, that when you look at the sample ballot advantage in Springfield, it was identical to Sully. And we picked up Sully and almost took the school board seat in Sully on the same day. So Pat Harrity and Elizabeth Schultz should both be looking at this saying, whoa, Springfield's not safe anymore. We might lose our re-elections next time. Okay. Well, this certainly sets up, uh, for me anyway, a, a, a nice 2016. And we'll come back to this in 2017 and 19. Folks, uh, stick with us. Uh, we've got Ben in the next segment. So if you want to stick around for that. tell which kids have trouble with their eyesight. But that's not always the case. Even though one in four children may have a vision problem, eye doctors tell us the symptoms aren't always so obvious. We do know that 80% of all childhood learning is visual. And without good vision, kids can have trouble learning to read. And may fall behind in school. For clues on how to spot the real life signs of childhood vision problems and what parents can do, visit checkyearly.com. A public service message from the Vision Council of America and reading is fundamental. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Hi folks, Cesar back with you. Uh, here with uh, Dr. Sam. election <laughs> analyst extraordinaire, not Dr. Sam. But Ben Trippett, my dear friend, thank you again for coming on and sticking around for the second segment. Right. Uh, we were talking about uh, Prince William County. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about uh, the chaos there, the flipping of the school board and, and other stuff. So school board, why, why do you think that uh, ended up flipping? Well, you know, Prince William's been trending Democratic in the mm -hmm. southern part of the county. A lot of people moving in there. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's three very Republican districts in the north that drive the countywide elections. Mm -hmm. um, but with a split field this year, uh, the Democrats were able to take the chairmanship of the Prince William School Board. There was a three-candidate race for that. And then they picked up both of the other seats in southern Prince William. So the four more Democratic-leaning districts in southern Prince William are all Democrats now. Interesting. So that's what a future Democratic majority on the Board of Supervisors might look like as well. Mm -hmm. Um, it's the same eight-member board for each school board and board of supervisors in Prince William. Now the school board will be five to three Democratic. The board of supervisors stays six to two Republican. So, uh, and again, for the folks at home, what do you think that means for that county? 
um, in terms of just, you know, it school. means an absolute brawl yeah. um, because the Republicans that have controlled the Prince William School Board have been pushing money to the north where the Republican voters are and to these new schools mm -hmm. and not dealing with the class size issues in the south mm -hmm. where there's a lot more Democratic voters. Mm -hmm. um, so you're going to see a massive shift in resources in mm -hmm. Prince William County, I think, from this new school board to where they're directing it. It's interesting where you have a lot of diversity. You tend to have a lot more Democrats. Why is that, Ben? I can't figure that out. <laughs> really, really a big mystery, but it just always seems to happen that way. Yeah, yeah. Why is that? You, you have density, diversity. Those are Democratic precincts. Interesting. Someone needs to do a study. We're going to figure that, that out. Yes, yeah, figure that out. Um, let's move north into Loudon, if we can, yeah, a little absolutely. bit. Loudon. Any uh, big uh, surprises? Any anomalies you see in Loudon? Well, look. I mean, I think that late Democratic surge. Um, which I, by the way, credit that surge that happened all over Northern Virginia to the ads that Governor McAuliffe ran for Jeremy McPike. I think putting that much money in the D.C. network television on mm -hmm. the gun issue refocused people. I think mm -hmm. it energized Democratic voters mm -hmm. um, because the polling for everyone internally was off this year, um, favoring more, it was more Republican. I mean, look how scared Jennifer Boisco was in the last week of her race, mm -hmm. and she won by 11 points. Mm -hmm. um, the The... The big factor here is that th these weren't all bad numbers. They were actually, it changed late in the game. And mm -hmm. the composition of the electorate changed. And I didn't see any other event that happened besides those ads that were being run in that race. Wow. And, and we saw the same thing in 07 when there was a big race between Tom Davis's wife, Jean Marie Davis, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Chap Peterson. And Chap and Jean Marie both went on network television. And it drove elections across the area because that focuses people. Mm -hmm. um, that gets their attention. Now, network television in DC, 1,000 points, 680,000 a week. So they're not really cheap to get those people focused. Well, that's why the governor but, pays for that, right? Right, but, but, <laughs> but worth every penny in this yeah. one. And I give the governor a lot of credit because I actually think Phyllis Randall, who won a three-way race for chairman of the board of Loudoun, mm -hmm. in a tight three-way race, yeah. I think she actually, when you look at the amount of surge we got in other areas, assuming she got that same surge in Loudoun, she might have actually been third place. It may have been more of a 34-34-32 race with her at 32 and the, Repub the two Republicans at 34, and that late surge took it to a 38-31-31 race. So the, the districts in Loudoun, which were the ones that really kind of surged her over the top? The there? eastern districts in Loudoun. Eastern. Um, so western but, Fairfax but, bleeding over into eastern Loudoun. Right, but at, at the same time, she got 38% of the vote. Mm -hmm. And look, I mean, I think that when you have anyone looks at that, they're going to say, look, Phyllis gets four years now to get known Loudoun County wide, mm -hmm. but she's starting with a base of 38%. Mm -hmm. And what's really scary is one of the reasons why only two other Democrats won with her is that when you look at the supervisor vote by district, it looks like most of those two, the votes for the independent and the Republican candidates went Republican down ballots. So it looks like it was Republicans that were splitting off there. And the Democrats are not really close to 50 yet in off-off years in Loudoun County. Hmm. Well, Loudoun County's always been crazy for me just because, you know, you had this controlling entity or this mind of, uh, you know, no new taxes or no investing and no structures, no to Metro. Uh, is any of that going to change with even the three votes that, that potentially can be voiced by the Democrats? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's a, um, obviously the Metro is approved five to four with an all Republican board. Yeah. Um, so there are by some moderates, vote. right? By one vote. Five to four. Yeah. Um, and I, so there are some Republican moderates on there. Mm -hmm. And I think that they will team up with the Democrats to provide some level of governance for the county. Um, but look, Loudoun County is still going to be a real political wasteland for Democrats until they figure out how to mobilize their voters in off off year elections. Well, I mean, prior to this election, Senator Wexton was the only elected Democrat in Loudoun, correct? Um, well, Barbara Favola had a couple of precincts. Got, yeah, a couple of precincts. And then um, Kathleen Murphy won the special, and she has a few precincts. But okay. yeah, in the heart of Loudoun County, Jennifer Wexton really it. Yeah, because um, her, I think her district was pretty much all Loudoun with some Fairfax right. Herndon. But it's a very gerrymandered part of Loudoun County. Of course you it know. is. <laughs> like it's, it's the most Democratic precincts that the Democrats put into that district. Yeah. They dump the Republican ones to the Dick Black district. Yeah. So she's not really representing the whole of Loudoun County. Interesting, interesting. Redistricting is a topic, I don't know if you want to get into it now, but that, Ben, we just need to fix that once and for all. Both sides, mm -hmm. right? Because it really does diminish this whole democracy notion. Right, where people can actually vote for their elected officials. Well, look, I think redistricting would be nice. Um, I also think that when you look at how uncompetitive the House Democrats have been, mm -hmm. 
I don't think it would make that big of a difference. I don't think that's why the Republicans have the edge they do in the House delegates. Mm -hmm. I think it's because the caucus is, it, Democratic caucus is pathetic. Um, they, why is that? Why is that? They, look, the, the seats they picked up here would have been, the two seats that they picked up this year would be what you would call 34 and 36 in terms of if you numbered number one, the most Democratic, number 100, the most Republican. Um, so they're not even close to operating into picking up 51. They're, they're operating, picking up 34 and 36. They lost seat number 32 in an open seat. So they're still, that's why they're at 34. They, they, they still don't even have the 33 most Democratic districts are not all blue. Um, and, you know, I feel like, you know, afterwards they're like, oh, we picked up a seat. We should get a, a winner's trophy. And the de delegates are posting on Facebook like they, they won the election. They, they won 33 seats out of 100. Yeah. It is pathetic. So that's a leadership issue for me. I take that. I'm sorry, Cesar. Yeah, they won yeah. 34 seats out of 100. Okay. I don't that's want to still, it, 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 well, it blocked the majority, <laughs> does it? It's a super, if, if you had a super, super majority in the Senate, okay. it would matter that you could block the governor's vetoes in the House. Okay. You can already block it in the Senate. So, like, okay. blocking the super majority is meaningless in the okay. House. Okay. But it, it takes time. Yeah. And we have those every two years. So, mm -hmm. that's a good thing. Um, but for me, that's a leadership issue. And I will tell you, I've talked to a bunch of the delegate candidates. There was almost no support from the House caucus. That's right. Why is that, Ben? Why, why do you think they're that disorganized? Is? Um, I think a lot of the members don't want to give that much money to them because they give them bad advice on where they're putting the races. Um, and so, you know, they tell them put money here. They do. The people don't aren't even competitive. And then the next cycle, they're saying, why, why, why would I put money back in where you're telling me to put it? Mm -hmm. um, it's just it's a it's it's horrible. And um, and until they address why it's horrible, it's going to continue to be horrible. Mm -hmm. But I, I think like they don't address that. They, instead, they want to come to. But well, we won the selection. We picked up one seat. Well, at that rate, you know, we'll have a Democratic majority in 2049. <laughs> right. That'll be great. Yeah. Oh, by default, it should trend that way anyway. Absolutely. So, um, okay, well, enough of the House. Um, we've talked about the Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked a little bit about the, the sort of supervisors and stuff like that. What else do you see out there that was like... Um, you know, maybe big or we should look out for or maybe even go into the next year. What What's on Ben's radar to watch uh, these days? <laughs> well, I just think if we're going over last year's elections, I mean, what just happened. Yeah. The other uh, interesting one that I thought was Falls Church City, a tiny little city. Okay. But um, a late issue popped up there. You know, the Democratic committee chair Rob, um, had been arrested and charged with child molestation a few years ago yeah. and was convicted. Yeah. And his wife was the mayor. And um, what ended up happening was late in the campaign, the Republicans ish, uh, found, uh, did a FOIA and got all the Democrats had written letters in support of him saying, uh, please don't have him a harsh sentence the first time he had been convicted because um, we're his friend. They released it on a website. It blew up oh the God. city council elections. Democrat, uh, the last Democrat barely hung on to his seat. Oh. Um, Falls Church is basically Republican controlled now. Um, just oh. a shocker oh. um, in this city and the Democrats are gonna have to rebuild over there. Wow. This is what happens when you put a relationship in front of your values, right? You know, and yeah. I, I actually knew this gentleman, too, and, like, I was shocked when he when it first arrested. I had no idea that yeah. he was capable of such a thing. But, you know, the idea that after the conviction that, that they wrote the letter. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, they wrote the letter post-conviction. Yeah. And I think that's what the real issue was. was yeah. and, and these signs went up all over the city that said, I support the girls. And... Um, it was it was a big mover. I mean, Falls Church is a very democratic city. So this is uh, is there a mayor involved here? Is there a council? Well, the mayor or? resigned um, okay. after this was first happened. But okay. no, this was um, this basically the city is now Republican controlled, oh. and it's something to watch out for because that's the the, the toehold that the Republicans have in the, in the eastern part of Northern Virginia. Interesting, interesting. Wow. And it yeah. shows all politics is local. It really is. It really is. Um, wow. Any other nuggets like that across? The northern part or across the state? You know, I mean, I, I think you're going to see some more interesting elections come up this March. Mm -hmm. I mean, this May. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, after the presidential primaries, we'll have some town elections. Not in Herndon, uh, brother. Right. We move those to November. So. Yep. And that's going to be very helpful, I'm sure, to the Herndon incumbents not to be on the ballot in May. Um, well, I, I, uh, again, everyone has their opinion on it, but I just felt that uh, I supported it publicly because elections and town elections there's such low turnout to begin with, off years. Well, that's why the Republicans come so close in Herndon in the May yeah. elections, because yeah. it's very low turnout. And there's very few but places. But it's not true representative government. Right? No, it's not at all. And so, um, and so it'll really benefit the, the Democrats that did squeak in last time. And it was very close when they squawk in. Mm -hmm. um, th that will benefit them a lot to have the election in November, I think. I, you know, whatever way it goes, I, and I think I know what way it goes, I'm more comfortable with just more people voting into the system 
that reflects what the actual majority of the voters want. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, that's what it is. Whether it's a Republican district or precinct or Democrat or what have you, I just think more people should just vote. Yeah, I, mean, I take more of a partisan look at it yeah. because you look at someone like Tom Rust, who is a, a harmless yeah. a person who sat there as mayor for quite a time, yeah. and then he became a harmless member of the House of Delegates for a while, yeah. enabling the Republican majority in Richmond. And I think that you got to look at these things. And, and, and in my opinion, the Democrats have started treating these local elections very seriously and winning these because the Republicans use them as an opportunity as a leapfrog. And I think you will see John Cook as an example in Fairfax County. He will attempt to run for the state Senate. I don't know if it will be next time or when it's an open seat, but he will attempt to move up at some point, and the reason that he's able to attempt to move up is because of the name ID that he's built as supervisor. And so letting people have toeholds into these seats is very dangerous. So you, you kind of went into a subject maybe I want to talk a little bit more about, probe this thing. Um, Virginia state politics. Lieutenant governor, attorney general, governor. Okay. Who do you see out there going for what, where, and when? Well, I, I mean, I think it's still too Total early to tell. Total speculation. You know, yeah, yeah. I, it's hard for me because I have been so immersed in this year's election. Okay, okay. I, I'm, I'm not, Do you hear anyone I'm not say out of it yet. Think, well, you know, yeah. people are starting to make their rounds around, okay. you know, but I, I, I gotta tell you, I, I was happy today. I spent the day painting, oh. um, painting the basement, um, because- You don't have any paint on you. So I don't have any paint, well, no, I saw my hands, but, um, because it's like after the election, I'm just trying to decompress from this election. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that's the great thing about Virginia. You know, we have a presidential primary coming up in three months, oh, yeah. um, which is going to be a fascinating one. We got to see who even makes the ballot there. Um, followed up by obviously, you know, the governor's election is, is right around the corner because the primaries are next are ju next June, so June, it'll be right. um, 18 months out. Yeah. So candidates really have to get in, out there and start moving things for statewide elections in the next few months this year. Right. Um, so On you're absolutely right to start. Noise, right? Oh yeah, you're, well, you're right to start talking about it. I, I, I haven't paid attention yet, <laughs> but that's my next focus. As soon as I'm done painting my basement. Well, when are you going to be done that? <laughs> you know, this week. Okay. Well, then let's post schedule. Thanksgiving. <laughs> post Thanksgiving. Okay. <laughs> uh, are you in town for Thanksgiving? Yeah. I am. Okay. Well, post Thanksgiving. All right. Post painting. All right. Post anything else that you're talking about. I want you back on the show. All right. I want to do a special on uh, a Ben look ahead. All right. All right. We'll call it Ben's analysis on. 2015, 16 and beyond. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Ben, thank you so much. Good to see you, I'm man. always, always thrilled to have you here. Right. Thank you. Thanks Absolutely. So, folks, uh, thank you, Ben, again, and thank you for hanging around. We've got uh, a couple more segments coming up. Please stick around. Thank you. Wash your car at home. When I wash my car, everything runs down the street and down into the storm drains. With all the chemicals and the soaps and waxes, the last thing I want to do is poison my own drinking water. At least here, it's all contained and recycled on site. That's why I also take my car in for oil changes instead of doing it myself. I might take a chance on spilling stuff. You know what the best part is? What? More time to kick back and watch the game. How far would you go? To protect the planet. I want you to build an ark. Here we go. Okay, that's good. Oh, okay. Ow. Oh, oh, oh. Maybe there's another way. People, the flood is imminent. Is it too much to ask for a little precipitation? Go to fightglobalwarming.com to find out what you and your community can do to reduce global warming pollution. Somewhere around the world, there are men and women of the armed forces risking their lives, helping rebuild communities after natural disasters, collecting toys for needy children, tutoring kids in school. These are your sons and daughters who work to keep us safe, secure, and free. Dedicated men and women who put their country first. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Hi, folks. Cesar here again. Thank you for coming back. Um, 
We've got uh, a next guest coming up, um, Jacqueline Pujol. She is with the Enroll Virginia organization. She is an education and outreach specialist. Folks, healthcare is pretty uh, crazy and expensive out there. So Jacqueline, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Cesar. Thanks for being on. Just real quick for the folks to know, because this is a very personal and passionate thing for me and a lot of other people. Why do you do what you do, just on the surface? Why are you involved? What gets you going in the morning? So I uh, really believe that healthcare is a universal right for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and also, um, just to give you a little bit of background of me, uh, I grew up having health insurance throughout my childhood, through uh, teenage years, mm -hmm. up until my father and my mother divorced. Um, and I went about four or five years without health insurance. Uh, so those were four or five years that we had to basically live without um, any access to doctors, just basically hoping that nothing happens to us. Um, mm. So for several years, uh, we went without health insurance and I know what the feeling is. And okay. there are many minorities out there, um, individuals who currently do not have health insurance and healthcare um, is very expensive without insurance, as you probably know. Oh, sure. I mean, look, um, I've been blessed. I, I have jobs and a career where mm -hmm. that's all provided. But um, thank God we have Enroll Virginia, right, <laughs> to help people get there, right? And, and let's right. talk a little bit about some of the, the sort of support and some of the initiatives and the focus of, of what Enroll Virginia is. Help us what do they do? Mm -hmm. What do you do? I mean, walk us through that. So Enroll Virginia is a nonpartisan community-based community organization. Mm -hmm. We are located throughout the entire state. Mm -hmm. uh, we have offices um, just in Northern Virginia, um, in Alexandria, Arlington, Oakton, Leesburg, Herndon, um, Manassas, and Woodbridge. So, so we're dense throughout. population centers. Yes, okay. and we all um, work through different nonprofit organizations. Mm -hmm. um, I specifically work for Legal Services of Northern Virginia, and uh, being an education and outreach specialist, I um, provide basic education on how insurance works, also uh, on the Affordable Care Act and um, outreach to let folks and the community know that we are here um, to assist with the application for free mm -hmm. and um, in an unbiased manner. So what, what's that process like? Walk me through, okay, so how do you come across, let's say mm -hmm. I've, I've recently lost my job or moved to the area or I've got a family, um, how do I get in touch or how do you help me or mm -hmm. what do I do? Okay, well if it's open enrollment, mm -hmm. like it is right now, mm -hmm. um, then you can either go online on healthcare.gov um, and fill out the application on your own, select a plan, um, and enroll. Um, if you are not comfortable using a computer, uh, you can give us a call. Uh, we have a statewide hotline, uh, and you can sit with one of our navigators or in-person assisters that can um, guide you through the entire application. Uh, so basically, uh, the assister will fill out the application for you mm -hmm. and uh, help you go through the plans and make sure that uh, you are selecting a plan that is best for you that most meets your needs and budget. And what's, what's that time frame? I mean, if, if mm -hmm. someone calls, they're on the phone, I mean, how much time does that take, you know, walking um, them through? So the actual appointment can take about an hour to an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. Depends on how large your family is. Um, if it's just one person applying mm -hmm. for himself, then it can take uh, about 45 minutes, an hour. Um, but if it's um, you know a larger family, it'll take it can take up to two hours even. And um, somebody can you know call our hotline and we'll mm -hmm. respond within one or two business days. Um, schedule the appointment. Right now, because we are in open enrollment, um, we are very busy and uh, we are booked for the next couple of weeks. But thankfully, you know, open enrollment is through January 31st, so we have a lot of time um, to assist. What's a typical profile of the person that, that seeks the support services? I mean, they're, mm -hmm. are they older? Are they single? Divorced? I mean, younger? I mean, what? it ranges. We get yeah. the whole gamut, um, mm -hmm. but. Mostly it's individuals who either have a uh, language barrier, do not speak the, you know, do not speak English very well, or uh, individuals who are not comfortable filling mm -hmm. out the application online, or individuals who may have had trouble uh, applying over the phone, mm -hmm. the 
the marketplace call center may have gotten cut off or they didn't understand the person well and so they're seeking um, assistance uh, that is in um, their language mm -hmm. and uh, in so their you have trained translators. Yes. Different. Oh, that's good. Uh, so a lot of our the assisters are bilingual. They speak different okay. languages, and we also have interpreters for. There's a hundred some plus languages in Fairfax County. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just I find that astonishing every time. I think it's. Yes. It used to be 104. Now it's 120 or something outrageous. It's impressive. Yeah. So what? Um, What's the biggest like challenge you guys deal with? What's what's the biggest obstacle for some people, and what's or the biggest source of frustration? Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you so for assisters, and I can tell you from personal experience because mm -hmm. I was a navigator for over a year. Mm -hmm. um, what the, does that mean, real quick? What is it? A navigator yeah. is a person who is federally certified to assist with enrollments, and um, aside from helping with enrollments, you also have to provide some outreach and oh, education. Okay. Yeah, so during open enrollment season, we're busy with generally just enrollments. Um, and the most challenging, frustrating part of the job is, um, but also very rewarding, um, is helping individuals who are not familiar with insurance at all. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a majority of the consumers who come to our office. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to take much longer. Uh, it, we have to be much more patient go through the process much slower, mm -hmm. uh, make sure that we explain the terms, uh, make sure we explain the details in each insurance that's being offered to them. So what, what sort of um, maybe apprehension or what, what comes back from the, the, the customer? Mm -hmm. I mean, what are they experiencing? What are some of the things that they're grappling with? So the cost mm -hmm. uh, for many individuals, uh, they'll be able to find a, an insurance plan that's mm -hmm. affordable. But even um, affordable, you know, is relative. So sure. an in, a plan might cost $100. And to some people, that might seem affordable. But mm -hmm. to others who have never had insurance, who do yeah. not understand what insurance is, don't understand the value of it, mm -hmm. uh, it can be very hard to, to um, enroll in, in something that costs that much a month. Do, do people understand, specifically the non-native English speakers, mm -hmm. do they understand the, the reasons and the requirements for having health care? Right. A majority of the ones who come to our office, yes, but mm -hmm. there are many individuals out there um, who do not yet understand the law and are not aware that they need to have health insurance or they face a penalty. How do they come to you then? I mean, it, it, are they just in a state of confusion, or, or what sort of questions are they mm -hmm. sort of coming to to you all with? And kind of help me with that. Um, so most individuals who are coming to our office have heard about us um, mm -hmm. either through a presentation or through an organization that they've mm -hmm. received help in. Um, so most individuals who are coming to us are aware that they need to enroll uh, in this thing called health insurance. I was told to come here, right? Uh, right. Okay, so, okay. I was told by my friend or by my mom that I need to get health insurance. Mm -hmm. Please help me. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then what, 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 it's a day or two before they get in, apply, and then they're notified? What, what usually happens after? you know, the, the process gets activated. I mean, what, So what is you, it's instantaneous. Um, uh -huh. You fill out the application, and then um, you are told whether or not you're eligible for a tax credit, which, uh, for those who might not know, a tax credit helps lower your um, premium, your monthly premium. Mm -hmm. um, so the eligibility results are provided instantaneously once you fill out the application. Um, from there, you... Uh, choose what kind of health plan you want to enroll in based on you know the subsidy that you receive and then is that um is that pretty well understood by people i mean i i mm -hmm. just i keep thinking of the the immigrant or the non-english speaker that might right. get lost or concerned or afraid mm -hmm. of that stuff I mean, yeah no it's not well understood okay. it's not well understood until the day of the appointment until mm -hmm. you receive you get your eligibility results you know on the screen and um, you explain it to the individual, mm -hmm. and that takes time because a tax credit isn't something that they've ever had to deal with yeah, before. I mean, right. <laughs> if, so. if I've never filed taxes, mm -hmm. right, and, and I'm new, or you know, maybe I'm here undocumented, I mean, well, what, those what's happening who, there? 
Uh, just to straight, straighten something out, um, those who are undocumented or do not file taxes are not ob are not obligated to have health okay. insurance, and they're okay. also not um, they're not going to be penalized if they don't have health insurance. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. What? Um, wh so this is a result of the the Affordable Health Care Act, correct? Yes. So it's driving a lot of this process. I mean, just. What's what's in role Virginia's sort of um, impact, or, or has it been impacted, and, and if so, how? How do you all see the Affordable mm -hmm. Health Care Act kind of over the next few years? I mean, is, there's this threat of like uh, repeal and replace and, and mm -hmm. all this other stuff. I mean, does that affect you guys at all? You're just focused on doing. We you know, try not to think about that possibility. Okay, um, that. Yeah, okay. we're just being very efficient right now. Um, so Governor McAuliffe is is behind. Uh, expanding affordable health care. Does that yes. affect you all in a sense? Uh, well, it has affected us. Uh, last year, uh, Governor McAuliffe provided uh, about a million dollars in grants to uh, staff an additional 100 in person assisters. For the organization? Yes. Wow. So, not okay. specifically for Enroll Virginia, for the all of the organizations that are providing okay. assistance throughout okay. Virginia. Okay. And we were one, one of three, I believe. Um, that received this grant, and with that grant, we were able to hire over 70 assisters. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned earlier um, some of the uh, sort of uh, spots or, or the, the places. They seem to be Northern Virginia, very dense areas. Mm -hmm. uh, when we come back from the break, I want to maybe talk about a little bit about uh, sort of the rural, the, the less dense corridor of, of Virginia. There's right. a lot of it. I mean. Folks mm -hmm. out there obviously need affordable health care, and maybe let's talk about um, sort of the, the approach or the thoughts on, on, on that segment okay. um, when we come back from the break. But um, in terms of um, uh, your website, just uh, if we can put up the website, uh, mm -hmm. folks, um, enrollva, is it, dot org? Enrollva.org, yes. So people can start going there today to get information and... and also to uh, schedule an appointment okay. under the contact tab, um, contact us tab, uh, there's a connector tool, which is what we use to schedule individuals, uh, okay. schedule appointments for individuals. And that has uh, all the 800 numbers and contact numbers and mm -hmm. emails and, and all that stuff. Yes. Okay. Because it, it is a big issue. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I know family that can't afford health care. So. Folks, when we come back, we'll uh, delve into the other parts of the state that people need help with. Saving for retirement might be easy for some folks, but for others, it might take a little more work. And for those who haven't started, there are still things you can do to catch up. Oh, that is good news. Like getting out from underneath past debt. And don't get wrapped up with high interest credit cards. Let's get you some eyes. Be diversified with your investments. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Your financial goals are not out of reach. The choice is clear. For a happy ending, choose to save. Everyone with alcohol and drug addiction is in the same boat. With treatment, you can find solid ground. For drug and alcohol information and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Dude, are you sure you want this tattoo? Because, just do it! Some mistakes in life are permanent like hearing loss. To learn how to protect your hearing, visit ASHA.org. You've probably heard about heart disease, but did you know that it's the number one killer of women nationwide? Heart disease claims more lives each year than breast cancer, lung cancer, or strokes combined, but there are steps you can take to protect yourself against it. For more information on how you can prevent heart disease, contact your local American Heart Association or visit their website at www.americanheart.org. We're 
back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Hi folks, Cesar here. Welcome back for our final segment. We're here with Jacqueline Pujol. She's with Enroll Virginia. She is an education and outreach specialist. Thank you for coming back. Uh, before the break, we talked a little bit about some of the challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly Virginia, people getting affordable health care. Um, we seem to identify sort of the denser pockets, but let's say you're in the rural areas. You know, what are your options out there? You know, just internet, mm -hmm. phone calls, or, or what do people do? Either internet, uh, our website, or uh, our statewide hotline. Um, mm -hmm. There are less offices throughout the entire state. Um, it's much more area to cover, so it's mm -hmm. going to be more difficult to find uninsured there um, to try to reach out to them. Um, but we definitely recommend um, finding us on our website. Quick mm -hmm. Google search ACA help in Virginia, and you can find us there. And they go through the same process, make appointments and, yes. and interviews. And we, they can do that over the phone and everything? Over the phone, um, mm -hmm. but ideally uh, online if they can uh, go on, on, the, web, on mm -hmm. um, the website. Uh, we actually use, uh, like I was mentioning, the connector tool. It's uh, getcoveredamerica.org slash connector. It's where you can schedule an appointment online, and it's going to be the fastest way because if you call, you're going to have to wait a couple of days, and then um, until then, you'll be scheduled for maybe two or three weeks from that point. Oh, wow, really? Mm -hmm. uh, so you guys are busy. Very busy, yes. So how, how many people now are still, le I mean, you may not know the numbers, but just... Mm -hmm. Ballpark, how many people are still uninsured in Virginia? It's about um, a little bit over 400,000. Really? Okay. Yeah. That many. And uh, the great news is that uh, in a state that did not create its own marketplace program, uh, mm -hmm. we were able to uh, insure a little bit under half of the uninsured population in just the first two years. Really? Yes. Wow, that's great. Mm -hmm. and, so. and you all have driven that. We'd like to most, think so, okay, yes. No, really. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's why I wanted to kind of talk to you all in terms of, like, what, what sort of things do you think are driving, um, you know, are you doing events, are you doing marketing, I mean, you're doing things like this, but mm -hmm. what sort of things are, are driving sort of that whole enrollment? Uh, marketing on a very low budget. Uh, mm -hmm. We try to do PSAs, um, press releases. Uh, we work with the radio, especially the minority radio stations, mm -hmm. um, like the Spanish radio stations, mm -hmm. the local TV stations. As you know, a uh, majority of those who are uninsured are minorities, yeah. especially in this... They tend to be poor. Yeah, and especially in this yeah. northern Virginia area, a sure. lot of them are Hispanic. Yeah. Um, and so we use the um, Hispanic radio stations and the TV channels mm -hmm. um, okay. to provide, to market our services. Do you do you market or target neighborhoods or districts or? I mean, yeah, uh, recently we have been uh, since it is getting harder and harder to reach those uninsured uh, pockets mm -hmm. in Northern Virginia. At least uh, we use some websites like the CountyHealthRankings.com mm -hmm. and uh, the city zip code. Um, another website where it kind of shows you where uh, lower income populations may be residing. Wow. And then mm -hmm. you all put on events or, or? Yeah, we either have ACA uh, workshops or okay. presentations. Uh, we work with the local governments, mm -hmm. so with the county um, CSB, with social services. Um, we also work with community organizations that are already very involved in their communities. So typically you'll be at what, a, a library, a high school? I mean, how, how yeah, so um, right here uh, locally we are having an ACA workshop, an Affordable Care Act health insurance workshop this Thursday. Um, it's from 6.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. in English and 7.30 to 8.30 in Spanish. Uh, and that will be ongoing every third Thursday of the month throughout wow. open enrollment, so through February, actually. And, and where, where is that exactly? At the Thomas Jefferson Library in okay. Falls Church. Okay, it's wow. Very, it's close by. It's yeah. right off of uh, Route 50. Um, you should get a lot of people there. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully. So, um, from an organization perspective, what, mm -hmm. maybe you can or can't share, but just 2016, I mean, 2015 sounds like you guys had a great sort of uh, outreach uh, success. Mm -hmm. 2016, any like big plans or anything that you see that you may want, if you could wave a wand, what does 2016 <laughs> look like for you guys? Uh, well, 
for 2016, not too sure. We kind of work uh, in the moment and for the next couple of months. Wow, so I can okay. speak to um, open enrollment. Mm -hmm. um, we will be hosting enrollment events every almost every Saturday in different locations to try to reach as many um, populations throughout Northern Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, and these are large enrollment events that we're hosting. Um, so either uh, one of the navigators, the sisters, or one of us outreach specialists are helping to organize this event. And um, we're expecting to assist between 60 to 100 individuals per wow, event. Wow. That's yeah. great. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take that 400,000 uninsured number, mm -hmm. right? I mean, how many of these events, wh when do you all think, will this ever get full coverage? Will, will Virginia be the first state to have everyone <laughs> uninsured have them insured? Is, is that possible? Um, yeah. We can try to shoot for that. But <laughs> That's why we're all, we're all a, guessing here. In a state that did not uh, create its own marketplace, in a state that right. did not receive as much money as a no, state-based marketplace, it's, yeah, well, it's we a have people challenge. in Richmond that uh, are opposed to this on philosophical terms. So it is a challenge, to your point. And I'll yes. say that I won't ask you to to comment on that. Um, so help me a little bit in terms of um, you know in terms of the whole. Uh, your structure, your organization, I mean, what are some of the challenges? Do, do you all take donations? Do you all take, I mean, I heard some of the grant monies, but mm -hmm. if someone wants to help you all, what do they do? Can they volunteer? Can they get certified? Yeah. I mean, so we don't take donations. Okay. Uh, we are strictly only using the grant money um, okay. to fund our positions, and very little money is left over for any marketing or outreach. But the way that individuals can help is by so Rupa, volunteering. So that grant money comes from the state? From the federal the government. The federal government. Mm -hmm. Nothing from the state? No. Well, okay. I mean, Terry McAuliffe, Governor Terry McAuliffe, did uh, provide an additional million dollars to um, fund the in-person assister positions. Right. Uh, but that was money from the federal government. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Okay. So you, you have this very small budget. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't have a lot of wiggle room, uh, then if people do want to help, um, what sort of volunteering opportunities are available to people that want to help? Uh, so what we call CAC position, it's the CAC. Certified Application Counselor position. Okay. Uh, you'd be uh, doing the same thing roughly as a navigator and in-person assister, um, except it would just be enrollment. Uh, so you'd be assisting on, with one-on-one -on -one enrollments, and um, I believe you can also assist with uh, presentations and um, getting the word out. So a, a CAC, uh, I, let's say I want to volunteer, and, mm -hmm. and so uh, what sort of commitment is it? Is it a, a, a four-hour evening, a week-long, a month-long training certification? So each year um, it can vary. Uh, the RCAC program is run through Northern Virginia Family Service, mm -hmm. and uh, I believe this year they're provide they're. Um, uh, making individuals or volunteers commit to at least four four hour uh, enrollment. Per week, per month, per? Four hours, um, four times total. Okay. <laughs> so for example, um, you could do you know nine to 12 uh, during four Saturday enrollment okay. events. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, all right, so you've got this CAC person. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're often volunteering. Uh, what are some of the other things people might sign up for or volunteer for? They can sign up to be a speaker, um, to go in the, their community and uh, talk about the ACA, try oh, to get the word out so like about to their our church services. or community group. Yeah. Or, oh, okay. mm -hmm. But um, I should say that all CACs need to go through uh, training. It's mm -hmm. a six hour training through CMS. Okay. Uh, so it's an online training, can be done at home, um, but you do need to go through that, and then uh, an orientation given through NVFS. And that's available to anyone that, that wants to do the CSA Yeah, okay. and we're especially in a huge need for um, individuals who speak different languages. languages. Yes. Right. Why did I know you were going to say that? <laughs> and interpreters, mm -hmm. too. So is it, um, is it a bigger challenge to to train them or to get them involved? I mean, it, it sounds like... Get them involved. Get them involved. So um, again, maybe that's part of the, the marketing. 
you're, you're hindered by the outreach marketing side, right? You can't right. really like go. I mean, unless like especially right now, our um, our focus is to provide outreach about the open enrollment. Mm -hmm. um, so we, as you said, we don't have that much funds for mm -hmm. marketing in general. Um, so it's a challenge to get people interested in volunteering for us. So uh, what do you guys do then? Go to the bus stations or, or go to the metro stations, hand out lit, uh, flyers? I mean, what, what sort of... So just a combination of everything. Yeah. Uh, we reach out to organizations via email. We go to um, local meetings, uh, like social service, week monthly meetings. Uh, we do Canvas uh, also. Oh, really? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so in local communities and large uh, either recreation centers or um, stores, grocery stores, put up flyers. Best ways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just, we have one in Herndon. Info and I, table. Yeah, I mean, look, um, I hand out voter registration stuff all the time there, and it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing how many people are eligible to vote, eligible for health care, but they just don't know it because no yes. one's taken the time to go there. So. Uh, what, what's the most rewarding thing for you as we close out the segment? What, what do you love most about uh, what you're doing? I love educating about just the value of health insurance mm -hmm. because I hear a lot of, oh, well, I don't need it. Um, nothing's ever happened to me. Um, it's too it's expensive. It's not worth mm -hmm. it. It's not worth my money. Uh, but I, while I am young, a young adult, I'm 25 years old, um, I have never really needed health insurance um, until a year, a, a year ago. Um, so it was my first visit to the emergency. And fortunately, I did have insurance uh, mm -hmm. offered through my job. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can say uh, from a personal level that health insurance is very valuable. Um, if I didn't have health insurance at that time, I would have been in, who yeah. knows, thousands, fifty thousand dollars of debt, at least. Well, it's <laughs> the single biggest cause of family Bank bankruptcy. Right? right. So if you don't think you need it, um, think of the odds in those terms, right? Yes. One, one illness could uh, do it. Jacqueline, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you Appreciate for having me, on. folks. Thank you uh, for watching, and uh, we hope. You can spread the word on Enroll Virginia. Uh, affordable health care is um, something people need out there. Thank you so much.